Hey guys, this is Kevin here from Hanna Instruments, and today we're going to be talking about the importance of calcium in your reef tank. So calcium is one of the major elements you have to monitor and test for in your reef on a regular basis. Um, it's one of the prevalent ions in salt water that make up uh, the chemical complex in your reef tank's water chemistry. And it's really important for uh, coral skeletal formation as well as different sort of invertebrate shell growth as well. Um, so calcium, uh, generally speaking, has a range of about 380 to 450 parts per million in the reef tank. That's kind of what you want to maintain and try and keep and aim for. Um, and a, a natural seawater tends to have about uh, 410 ppm, so we try and keep a, a good range there. So, uh, so like I said, calcium is really important for coral uh, skeletal growth, and anytime your corals grow, they're going to be utilizing using calcium up in your water. So you want to make sure that you are replenishing that calcium as your corals grow or different sort of invertebrates grow or you have coralline algae or different things like that. Uh, so it's really best practice to measure and test for calcium on a regular basis to make sure that you have enough in the water for your organisms to, uh, to grow and have enough ions to build their skeletons, but also make sure that there's not too much in the water when you're, when you're, you're not overdosing, which could cause problems as well. So. Uh, generally speaking, uh, calcium, uh, as you start adding more coral into your tank and your reef tank, uh, you're going to have to increase the amount you add to the water, and that could either be in the form of uh, supplementation or uh, increased water changes. So, uh, as, like I said, as you have different, different corals or different shrimp or crabs or invertebrates, or coral analogy for that matter, as these things begin to grow in your reef tank, they are going to be consuming calcium in the water. So you want to make sure that you are not only testing for it, but have a way to replenish it as these, uh, these different organisms utilize it. Um, so with that being said, uh, you know, a lot of people set up dosing schedules for, with uh, various automated dosing pumps or manual dosage of different sort of supplementation to help increase calcium. And that's really important because it, it helps, uh, you know, when you're not ready to take water changes or, you know, you're not doing as many water changes so often, you're able to replenish calcium in the water without having to do such a, a large undertaking of mixing of salt and doing a regular a water change, even though those are also very important. So uh, with that being said, uh, you know, when you're starting a dosing schedule, you want to make sure that you're testing very frequently to know how much calcium to add in the water to maintain that 380 to 450 range uh, to make sure that you have an adequate supply for all your different corals or, or shrimp or crabs or anything else that may use that in the water. It's really important that anytime you're adding coral to your reef tank, that you want to check the calcium. And anytime you remove coral as well, you want to also be checking the calcium because anytime you're you have an established dosing system and you're adding or removing organisms from the tank, whether you're fragging a larger, a larger colony of coral or you are adding a, uh, a new piece or a new colony to your tank, you want to make sure that the, the supplementation regimen that you've decided to the dose and the amount of uh, supplements you're dosing with um, are going to correlate to a, um, you know, to to having a, are not going to increase or decrease based on the, the amount of organisms you have in there. So generally speaking, if you have a lot more coral in your tank, you're obviously going to have to dose more calcium in your water. Um, the less coral you have, you're not going to have to dose as much. And if you have a, a pretty regular water change schedule, you may not have to dose at all. It really depends on your unique situation, but you really can't make that decision unless you test your water because uh, there's really no other way of knowing how much you need to add or dose or if your levels are, are accurately maintained without testing. And testing is probably the most important aspect of maintaining a successful aquarium because you know, many people really are just keeping, uh, more so aquariums are about keeping a proper water chemistry than anything else. So uh, with that being said, when you, one of the things that I like to use and we use here at Hanna Instruments to maintain proper calcium is our uh, HI758 calcium checker. And this uh, is a handheld colorometer. Um, so rather than some of your traditional chemical, chemical test kits, this uses light to measure absorbance uh, rather than trying to match a color to a chart. So these are really nice because they don't have any subjective color changes. They don't have any sort of uh, titrations or drops to count or colors to match in a chart. So you, it uses a digital readout to give you a precise number that you know is within a designated accuracy statement so you can be ensured that your calcium levels are properly maintained and your corals can be happy, healthy, and thriving in your home aquarium. So this calcium checker comes with everything you need to start testing. You know, you're going to get uh, enough reagents for 25 tests in here. Two cuvettes. These are these cuvettes are uh, are glass vials that you would fill up your water sample in, and these are used to have light pass through them and to determine your 
your absorbance or the, the color change for you rather than you having to do it with your eyes. So again, everything you see here, and this actually is a relatively updated kit. We have our new uh, mechanical pipette. So this test does use a very small sample size. It uses a 100 to 1 dilution to analyze calcium. So you're going to be using about 9 mils of RODI or distilled water and 1 mil of this liquid reagent, but only 0.1 mils of sample. And in order to kind of accurately uh, administer that sample, we give you a fixed pipette along with these tips here to, in order to, uh, to get an accurate measurement. So if we were going to perform a test with this calcium checker, the first thing you want to do is you want to make sure when you're, when you're first getting your checker for the first time to install a, uh, a AAA battery that comes with the checker and all you need is a little Phillips head screwdriver. Um, so that's just to, uh, you know, the checker's just running a AAA battery, um, so you're not going to have to worry about replacing them all that often or finding some unique battery for them. Um, so with these checkers, you only need to use one cuvette. We give you an extra one because it's really important. You want to make sure that your cuvettes stay uh, clean and not, they're not going to be scratched or anything like that. Um, so that's why we give you an extra one in case you may drop it or scratch it or things like that. And obviously salt water can cause a lot of stains on, on glass. You always want to make sure these stay optically clear because these are uh, optical based measurements with light. So you want to make sure this is uh, not impeded by any scratches, fingerprint smudges, things like that, especially salt creep. Um, so. The test comes with two reagents, a liquid bottle of reagent A and a, a pack of reagent B, the powder sachets. So you're also going to have a one mil syringe to administer the liquid reagent as well as um, this, uh, this little pipette here, this separate pipette to fill up your cuvette with RODI water. So if we were going to run a test here, where you're going to attach this, uh, this tip on here to the, these come with two tips, you're going to add one tip to the end of the pipette right there. That's going to be important because the, the, all your small salt water samples are actually going to be sucked up into this tip and none of the salt water is actually going to go inside of this pipette itself. It's really important to use these tips. Um, so if we're going to run a test, I have my salt water right here, right? And then I have some deionized water here. And now one really important thing about this particular test is not all deionized water is created equal. Obviously, a lot of our hobbyists, we have plenty of RODI filters at home. But it is really common for calcium to permeate through the deionization membranes. And since this test uses such a small sample size, if you have any calcium present in this, uh, this water used in the initial phase, it might throw off your readings. So you want to make sure that either you have a really quality RODI filter, or if you don't have access to it, you can just go to your local pharmacy and pick up um, just regular pure vapor distilled water. Uh, make sure there's no minerals added for taste or anything like that. You just want pure vapor distilled water. Um, that'll be enough to run you know, countless tests and you pretty much will have a lifetime supply of it. Um, so and also another really important thing too is when you're, uh, when you're cleaning your cuvettes, you want to make sure you never use tap water on any of the instruments we sell. Tap water kind of has a lot of unknown variables to it, but particularly with this test, uh, tap water has a lot of calcium in it for the most part. So even if you have residual amounts of uh, tap water here from cleaning your cuvettes, it may throw off the readings. So you want to make sure you're just using distilled water to clean these off or RODI water that you're, you know, has comes from a good filtration source that has its membranes changed frequently and has a really low conductivity or really low TDS uh, essentially, you know, as low as you can get it. That's kind of the most ideal situation. So if we were going to run a test here, first thing I would do is I would open up a liquid bottle of reagent A. Right. I'm going to add one mil of this, so I'm going to attach this tip onto the one mil syringe here. This is a one milliliter tip. So essentially when you suck up this reagent, all of the reagent is going to be in this tip. None of it is going to be in the syringe. And we just do that to make it a little easier to, uh, to make sure you're getting the right dosage so no one's confused. So we're going to bring exactly one mil of this right here. So you see all the reagents going to be right in that tip right there. I'm going to administer this to your cuvette. Right, just like that. And now another important, uh, well, another useful tip is we, we provide you with a, um, this little um, you know, relatively simple type pipette uh, to uh, fill up your cuvette with DI water, which is uh, you know, obviously more than sufficient. You would just fill up this to the 10 mil line right here. But what I like to do sometimes is I use a, a 10 mil syringe and you could just take your deionized water right here and just you know, measure out nine mils of DI water and do it that way as well. Um, but for the most part, filling it up to the line is more than sufficient. We just find that obviously measuring it out if you have a 10 mil syringe can be a little helpful for some people. So I'm just gonna add that right in there. 
And now it's really important too, that if you're filling it up to the line, you wanna read what's called a meniscus. And in this case, it would be a concave meniscus. So a meniscus is a curve that naturally occurs from surface tension when you're filling up glassware. So it's almost like a little U shape. So essentially you would want that little U, the bottom of the U to reach that line. So right here we can see it's pretty good. I may add a little, one more drop of water in there and then that'll be more than sufficient. Perfect. And when you're reading the meniscus, you want to make sure you're at eye level too. And you're not holding it up like I was doing before because that can actually cause the, uh, the curve of the line to be uh, skewed and you're not really getting an accurate measurement of whether or not it's uh, you know, right at the point it should be in. So once I add my reagent A and my deionized water, I'm going to recap my cuvette and I'm going to invert this three to five times. Right, you just want to be able to mix the reagent out. And this is your blank value, right? So this value right here is just to kind of determine a an amount that's um, you know without any reagent, without any salt water. So this is kind of a um, a starting point, if you will. Right. So I'm going to press this button on my checker, and I'm going to get a C1 phase. That's going to be your blank value phase to kind of determine the the starting point of your uh, of your your value. So uh, another little tip I like to do is. On these checkers, they all on the cuvettes, they have these little 10 milliliter line right here. This little 10 mil line is actually really good. Uh, it's called indexing your cuvette. So we like to face these forward a lot of the times. And this is just to, uh, you know, because as uh, when you're doing a C1 and C2 phase, having that uh, cuvette indexed in the same position each time is important because rounded glass isn't always the same. So as light passes through it, you want to create a, a point where it's a, the reference point is the same from C1 to the C2 phase we're going to have here. So as I, this, as I have my cuvette in there, I'm going to hit the, this button again. And you notice the checker is going to flash a few times and go to a C2 phase. Uh, when that's happening, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take one powder packet of this reagent B. You get 25 of these, so uh, this test essentially comes with enough reagents to start for 25 tests. And in the long run, the checkers tend to be a little more economical because you're only buying the reagents. You're not buying a whole new checker each time. So all of our major retailers or, or ourselves, we sell all the extra reagents. You can get them for a lot of local fish stores or different online retailers. So um, it's just once you kind of have your checker, you're just buying the reagents down the road. So it uh, makes it pretty easy to uh, kind of replenish your testing when you need to have more tests. So at this C2 phase, I'm going to take out this checker here, this cuvette here again. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to add use this pipette to add uh, the fixed dosage of salt water. So the way we would do this is once we have this tip attached, we would actually press down on this plunger right here. So this, this pipette has two stops. It's the first stop here, and then you'll notice a, a larger amount of force needed to go to a second stop. So when you're administering the water, right, when you're, when you're taking it from your tank or your sample cup or whatever you may be using, you want to push down to this first stop, and you'll feel a good amount of pressure right there. And obviously, if you push a little more, that's your second stop. But we're going to go down into this first stop right here. We're going to take the tip of this pipette, and we're going to insert it into our salt water sample. For just Not all the way down, just a few millimeters in there and we're going to slowly lift up, right? And that's going to allow us all the water to be sucked into that tip right there. That's going to be exactly 100 microliters or 0.1 milliliters. So we're going to then open up our cuvette here. We are going to administer this salt water to here. Just push down to the first stop, and then we're going to push down to the second stop to make sure all of that salt water is expelled. And when you're using these pipettes, you also want to make sure that you don't have any excess water on the outside of the tip. So before administering to the cuvette, you want to make sure there's no beads of water kind of hanging off there because that's going to be uh, out of the, the specific dosage you would need. Then I'm going to take one packet, one powder sachet of uh, a reagent B, the calcium reagent B. So with this, we notice all of our sachets have a little dotted line on them that goes from the top corner to the bottom corner uh, opposite. So you want to make sure you're actually using a pair of scissors to cut those open. Um, and what I like to do is I like to get all the reagent kind of in this, um, in the part of the, uh, in the part of the, uh, the sachet opposite of the cut. So that way when you're making a cut, you're not spilling any reagent. So we're just gonna cut right along this dotted line, just like that. And then you'll notice the powder packet opens up very easily. And this reagent is kind of a crystalline purpley uh, substance. Uh, so we're gonna add this to the uh, cuvette with the salt water and the reagent A. We're gonna add all that in there. Right. And uh, sometimes I like to also peel open this powder part right here to make sure I got all the reagent out. It looks like I did. So it's going to get any little bit left in there. And with this test, we're going to actually uh, insert, reclose the thing, reclose the, the cap of the checker, and we're going to shake vigorously for about 15 seconds. And this, this is just allowing us to, uh, 
to, to make sure all the reagents dissolve and make sure everything is kind of all the reactions are taking place properly. But after we mix it, we want to make sure that we let it have a little bit of time to settle because this vigorous shaking is going to cause air bubbles. And these air bubbles might actually cause uh, the light to refract or, or bounce off different places that may not lead to a, may lead to an inaccurate test or inaccurate reading. So it's important to make sure that these air bubbles are kind of a, are, are, um, have time to rest so we tell you to just kind of let them settle for a little bit before putting it inside the checker again. So it's really important with these checkers that the glass is free of any fingerprints or smudges because these are optical based measurements. You don't want the light source inside the checker to impede the, uh, the photo detector on the other side. So like I said, you want to make sure that in between uses you're using a microfiber cloth to wipe the, the glassware to prevent any smudges or fingerprints. So you're going to get a nice clean reading. It's pretty good. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to insert this back in the checker and again, you want to face that 10 milliliter marker forward. Um, and it doesn't have to be the 10 mil marker, it's just important that you uh, and insert the cuvette in the same position you did C1 and C2. Um, so that's just your, you're kind of indexing it to make sure that your blank value kind of matches the point that the light passes through as your actual reading value. So once the checker's in there, I'm gonna hit this button again and it's gonna flash a few times and then it's gonna give me my reading. So once it kind of, right, what's going on right now is the, the checker is scanning the cuvette. And you see I have a reading here of 455 parts per million. Uh, and that's pretty, pretty common because this salt water that I mixed up usually you know, is uh, just artificial seawater has a really high uh, natural calcium point to it. So generally speaking, it has a, you know, about an expected range of about 450. So we got a, obviously a good reading here and a good number. Um, so yeah, this is uh, what we like to use to measure calcium. And as I was talking about before, if you, um, don't have access to a pharmacy or don't have access to uh, a RODI filter or don't have access to getting distilled water. And you know, we do sell uh, deionized water. It comes in two sizes. A, you have a 230 milliliter bottle here as well as a, a gallon sized jug. And these are also good not just for running the calcium test, but they're also good for cleaning all of your cuvettes, your glassware, to making sure you're not introducing any potential contaminants or anything like that when you're running your test. So uh, yeah, so this is, uh, like I said, it's really important to regularly test your calcium in your reef tank. Uh, without kind of knowing what your value is, you wouldn't be able to accurately dose uh, the correct amount to maintain, maintain that 380 to 4, 450 uh, range. Um, and like I said, if your calcium is too high, it can have problems, but if your calcium is also too low, your corals might, have, might, might not have enough uh, uh, ions in the water to build their skeletal structure, which you know, could lead to a shortened lifespan or, or not a good amount of success in your reef keeping. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much guys. I really appreciate the time and you know hopefully you're you know you go out there and test your calcium more frequently. Bye.